I'm a family physician. I've been in practice of general medicine for about 35 years. So I see people with a wide range of problems. I have had hospital privileges for many years and I see people mainly for alternative kinds of problems. Um, I provide the suggestions in terms of nutrition, nutritional advice and supplements and diet and exercise. I try to help people lead a healthy lifestyle. That's probably what I specialize in more than anything else. My goal is always to help people understand themselves and understand causes of problems, help them connect the dots that led to the current problems that they have. And I enjoy doing that kind of thing. I've been very interested in the near-death study and continuity of life for many years. I think it began probably when I began to study the Edgar Cayce material, and I found that uh, that spoke to me. He somehow was able to draw a picture of the large field of healing that made a great deal of sense. He incorporated not only the fact that there's physical problems, uh, he was able to um, explain causes behind those physical problems that incorporated the, the psychological and the spiritual dimensions. And that resonated, I thought, this is great. There's depth to what I'm hearing. And in medical training, our primary emphasis is on the physical body. 95, 98% of it is, is the anatomy, the physiology, the pathology, the disease process, and how to treat it with medications. And I always had a sense that there was uh, much more to the problem than that. And um, I wanted to help people understand the process, what's behind the problem, and, and also how they could take care of themselves better. Integrative medicine is a new specialty in medicine. And what it incorporates is the fact that there is much more to the healing process than the way medicine's usually experienced with diagnosis and testing and examination and history taking and that type of thing. The primary form of treatment with conventional medicine is the use of medications and surgery and certainly to a certain extent counseling. But integrative medicine incorporates nutritional medicine to a large extent, not just for uh, the occasional severe food allergy, not just for overweight for those who are eating too much of the wrong kinds of foods, or taking too much salt if you have hypertension. We're talking about how can foods make us healthier, more vital? How can uh, eating well prevent disease from happening? How can it help with our basic vitality and health in many different ways? So nutrition is one element and exercise is another element. To a large extent in medical training, we aren't taught how to teach people to exercise enough. What is enough? As well as many other habits of well-being that will help us be healthy and, and before we get sick. Integrative medicine incorporates also traditional medicine in terms of herbology, uh, in terms of more modern use of supplements of various kinds. It also incorporates um, many spiritual practices like meditation and prayer and uh, respects these traditions that are part of the larger elements of society. So integrative medicine is trying to bring in a larger realm of medicine certainly the physical aspects, but also the emotional, the psychological, the spiritual elements as well. And so it's paying attention to that. Basically, it's also helping us to recognize that within each of us is our greatest ally for healing, that we have an indwelling spirit that knows uh, the quality of our choices and is ever present to help us do so. So I've had a sense that the spirit is a very real part of us. I, I see it as the source of who we are, the, the real being behind the scenes, and in various ways we have contact with it. And some have more contact with it than others, but often it's very present. It's nudging us, pushing us, helping us extract meaning from the experiences that happen to us. And sometimes it becomes very clearly involved when we get a nudge or a push in a certain direction and it turns out that the direction is very valid. Often at times, however, it's a matter of looking back in retrospect. I had nudges to think a certain way or act a certain way and chose not to, and in retrospect, I wish I had. Well, where did that nudge come from? And that's how I try to encourage people to be more aware of the fact that, that their inner being is a real part of who they are and is trying to guide them on. Yes, from the beginning, I've had a strong sense that there is a presence of life, there's a source of life. And uh, that's the real being who we are. The rest of it is, is uh, more the outer surface of it. It's like, 
it's it's like a suit of clothes, <laughs> and and you know you can change the clothes and change the colors in various ways, but the personality also changes in various ways by the feelings that we have and the thoughts that we think. But the inner being is a dynamic, continuous presence that is looking for ways to help us, encourage, to develop strengths, to express our own unique contribution we have to make to those around us. So I began to study dreams. I worked at a retreat center for several years and found out that the dream world was incredibly fascinating and revealing in terms of causes of problems. And so I was also working on my own dreams in the process of doing that and came to various revelations about insights as to my own concerns, some of my own frustrations, uh, but I was able to help other people understand their problems. So I conducted a study where I used dreams actually to help people understand themselves better. And uh, it was quite fascinating uh, in terms of helping people with chronic sinus problems and dreams. But in the process, I also became more aware of the fact that in the dream state, people have experiences other than their personal psychology unfolding, their emotions, their thoughts, that at times people would have real events that sure seemed to me as though they were visiting with people on the other side. And the more I explored this further, the more I read about it, the more I explored my own experiences along those lines, the more I developed a distinct confidence in, in differentiating what was a real experience with individuals on the other side communicating with spirits as opposed to simply working something through internally. And so as I pursued that further, I found that there were many more opportunities for people to get the reassurance they really needed. I began to hear more and more experiences from other people. Since our chapter on near-death studies began, I began to ask many more people when I would see them in the office, they would make comments about a relative or friend who had died recently. And in the process of my asking them, well, what happened, if you don't mind telling me what happened did you have any contact with that person afterwards? I found that most people have had some contact. And many times it was somewhat vague. It was a general sense that they were nearby, but at times it was distinct. It was like a, a pat on the shoulder. It was like a special hug. It was sometimes a special kiss on the cheek. And it was so real, it became a real experience that I reassured them was much more than something they were working through internally. I see people every day who have had some experiences with a loved one who's passed on. And in the process of asking them questions about it, I've become more sure that their experiences are worth hearing about. I'm like a family doctor, so I'm seeing 20 people a day approximately. And every couple days, I'll see somebody who will make a comment about a recent loved one who has passed on. And in the process of their mentioning it to it, I usually come back and I ask them, I hope you don't mind, but what happened after they passed on? If you don't mind my asking, tell me a little bit about what took place. Did you have any contact with the person after they died? And uh, most of the time they make the comment that, yes, indeed, I did have some connection. And uh, sometimes it's a matter of an experience with nature of some kind. A bird, certain bird came in a certain way, came to the window, which is very unusual, or some other connection with nature. But other times it's even much more clear than that, um, where they see the person. They see the person in the hallway. They greet them or they hug them. And it's as real as though the person were there. And they know that it's ephemeral because they disappear then soon after that. Often it's brief, most of the time it's brief, but it's so real it stays with them for an extended period of time. The near-death experiences that I've heard people refer to me generally follow the pattern of people feeling uh, somewhat out of sorts because they're not used to uh, being aware of a presence of themselves outside their body and they're looking down on it or they find themselves in a space which is much different than what they're used to but it's a much larger space their mind is much more open than usual it's not a matter of hallucinating or making something up or thinking about something internally about a frustration or fear or apprehension 
it's a broader expanse. It's as though they're having a peak experience they've never had before. They have never thought in such large terms with such a large perspective or with such an ability to understand the meaning behind what was happening. They have a greater sense of themselves than they ever had before. Many times people will be in contact with another being, often it's somebody they recognize who's welcoming them, a family member of some kind, and they're eager to say hi, and they're eager to catch up with the news about what has taken place. So there is a general sense of welcoming, of warmth, of cheerfulness, of joyfulness, and they're eager to be connected with this person. And so it adds to the legitimacy, but it also adds to the reassurance that um, uh, this must be okay. I've never felt so wonderful in my life before. Generally, when there is a drug effect, uh, the individual is thinking much less completely than usual. Generally, there's a sense of confusion. There's a sense of not knowing what's going on. There's a sense of unsureness, of insecurity, distress, anxiety, panic. Much different than the, the presence that's uh, experienced when somebody is having an out-of-body experience. They're very much aware of who they are. They're more confident, much more confident than usual as to what's taking place. Much more aware of details, much more aware of what's happened to them. They can make sense out of what's taking place in a greater uh, degree than, than usual. With a drug reaction, usually people are quite aware that they have taken something, but they aren't thinking clearly. The events that are taking place uh, don't fit together well. Uh, they don't feel healthy in most regards, and uh, they don't have a general perspective of what's taking place. When people are having an out-of-body experience, it's much different than that. Uh, it's much more clear. They remember everything in exquisite detail after the experience in particular, they have been changed in a profound way. They, they feel wonderful about what's happened, and it takes a while for it to slowly imprint itself on them, but uh, they feel as though their life has been changed, and over a period of time as it integrates them further, they continue to look back on it as a, a transforming type of experience. A drug reaction does not have that effect. A drug reaction generally will leave people with a sense of, of uh, discouragement, of apprehension, of fear, um, that it's a bad experience. They feel bad about themselves. Often there's not that much energy, they're not thinking clearly, and when they look back on the experience, they know something happened that was disorienting rather than clarifying. There's a real component to the out-of-body experience, which is, although it was unusual, it's more dynamic and more awakening than uh, they usually experience. And so uh, it's a healing experience often, whereas a drug experience is, a, is, is part of a disease experience. The scientific community generally is not interested in this because they haven't been trained to be interested in it. They've come to be trained by experts who know their work and what they're familiar with. It's primarily physical based, it's primarily medically based, it's primarily based on what can be seen, touched, felt, experienced with our five senses that we can relate to with basic scientific testing, which is primarily physical in its orientation. And as a result of that, we have developed a huge preponderance of belief in only things that are physical. And so if our major training centers and if our major mentors do not incorporate this in their classes and in their teaching centers and uh, professionals haven't been exposed to this type of thing, they don't have the professional legitimacy behind it to open it up. And that's why experiences like uh, Dr. Evan Alexander and other physicians who are highly regarded in the medical field are such important changing events for us because it gives credibility to the field to pursue it further and to believe what we hear from our patients or believe what we might experience ourselves. And I, I think it's remarkable. Uh, reminded of the wonderful experience of Alexander, uh, Dr. Alexander, when he was communicating with a colleague, a neurosurgeon. He was sharing the experience and the colleague began to look elsewhere 
drifting off as though he wasn't interested in the conversation. And finally, Dr. Alexander said, well, I'm not sure you're interested in this any further, but uh, what do you think about what I just shared with you? And his colleague said, no, no. For the first time, I'm understanding what happened to my father as he was dying. I was there while he was dying, and somebody else was in the room. And it sounded as though he was talking to his wife, my mother, and I didn't know how to make sense of that. And after hearing your story, I have somebody else's story to connect it to. And in medicine and in science, we aren't exposed to the stories and the experiences. They're not concrete, they're harder to pin down. We're dealing with subtle energy. We're dealing with experiences of consciousness, not physical experiences. And it makes it harder to pin down and say for sure this is what's happening. Those of us who are afraid to recognize, explore the realms of consciousness, aren't going to see the connections with that. And they're going to deny it when they see it. And some of them unfortunately get quite vehement about denying the fact that these are occurring. In large part is based on, on ignorance, not knowing, not being exposed to it, and also fear. That if you accept the fact that in consciousness this is what's happening to people and what's available to people, then you need to open up your whole view of life. You need to change certain beliefs about how you lead your life. What it comes down to is the basic qualities of living become much more important. How we treat each other, we need to own up to. We need to accept the fact that if we care for other people and we forgive them and love them and treat them with uh, respect and reverence, that this generates an energy which also is subtle, but it has an impact that touches us deeply and touches each other more deeply. And that there really are true values for how to live and how to care for one another. You'd think that this would help make the connection, but uh, many times that it's not enough. So I, I think primarily it's a matter of not being exposed to it, uh, which is not knowing about it. And the other thing is it requires a whole different paradigm of thinking. And people aren't used to that. They don't want to have to change their view of life. We become familiar with the way things are. And when we hear about a whole other way of incorporating much larger panorama of living, it threatens um, how we view life. We have to change that. And that's disorienting. People feel uh, it, it's too big of a challenge and so it's easier to deny what they're hearing instead of incorporate it or explore it further. People are afraid to bring this up in the public mainly because it's so different than usual. People want to be liked, people want to be accepted especially by the people that they're close to, their family members, uh, certainly professionals of any kind. We don't want to be excluded. We don't want to be considered less than sane. We don't want to be considered less than intelligent and, and less than somebody they can rely on, and especially close family friends. Um, even though the people we're close to we have trouble relating to and they're honest with us at times with the foibles and problems we have, on the other hand, we want to be accepted, we want to be loved, we want to be respected. And these experiences are still out of the ordinary. And especially for an individual when the first time they have an experience of such and they're, they're uncomfortable sharing it with others, or they share it and then they see the reaction of the other individual. If the other individual hasn't had an experience of this kind, they react in a way that rejects them or denies that it was real and they try to come up with an understanding related to their own personal experiences and rationalizes it as though it's not something that's real, but something that's a figment of their imagination. And so if people don't get support soon after starting to share it with others, there is this sense of rejection and a sense of that it's not real. And yet once it's happened, it's hard to deny that it's real, and yet people postpone sharing it with others if there's any sign of rejection. And it's so strange to them themselves that uh, they will not make much comment about it until it's become more a part of them over an extended period of time. So it's unfortunate, but the medical community doesn't support this in general. The religion community generally doesn't support it. And so when authority figures around us don't support it, then there's this tendency 
to think that it must not be real, that I'm making it up. And so there's a strong need to us to be accepted, uh, not only by people we're close to that our lives depend on to a large extent, by, but also authority people that we looked up to for guidance. And when they're not, they're not going to support us in these experiences, then it makes it harder to integrate them. Fortunately, the kind of work that's being done by many individuals in sharing these experiences is slowly getting the message out that these are real, that many people have them, that people have had these experiences for eons of time, since the beginning of time. Only um, they have been unusual and rare. Now that we have information much more available through all kinds of means and people are being exposed to these, they, they recognize the reality of them and they're starting to pick up on it and they're starting to treat them as real experiences that should be treated on a literal basis, not just symbolic or a introspective basis. I saw a wonderful image that made sense to me. It was an upside down triangle with the top of the triangle open and the lowest part of it, about 10% of it, is the physical body and then about 50% of it uh, was the subconscious and uh, so if you, if you have an inverted triangle and you draw two lines in it, the lowest part's the physical, which is a small part of who we really are. The middle part between the two lines is our subconscious and our memories of many things. And then the upper part is open-ended. That's the field of consciousness. And that's the connection that we have with other individuals too, but also with the larger uh, uh, source of who we are. And that makes sense to me. Sometimes these simple diagrams, um, uh, make it easier to comprehend. But it does come down often to having a personal experience. And once you have one, then you can begin to relate to other people who have had the experiences and you can begin to put it together and then try to make sense out of it. There's a wide range of ways of opening up and learning about these kinds of experiences. I think the first thing is just studying your own experiences in life and what happens. When we use our intuitive sense or our gut feeling about what might be taking place, we begin to make more sense of it. One way is at the end of the day, think about anything unusual or that was uh, especially uplifting during the day and review it and think about why it happened, how it happened, what it means, and what else it might be connected to. And asking open-ended questions like that of our own experiences helps draw us closer to our ability to understand them. So reviewing the day at the end of the day is one great way of doing it. Asking for help in the dream state, going to sleep at night and asking for a solution, a suggestion, or some way of understanding a, a problem we're having in our life, asking for a dream to help explore that, that opens us up, not only to our inner um, experience of understanding how we think and feel about things, understanding our own fears and doubts and worries, but also it can open us up to the much wider expanse of our inner mind, which is connected to the minds of other people. The other thing is beginning the day by thinking about how we would like the day to go. What is our primary purpose or mission for this day? What would we like it to be? and making a connection with that oasis within ourselves, our oasis of well-being or, or uh, the sort of the wellspring of life that we're connected to is like a fountain that's always radiating a certain degree of energy and uplifting us. Reviewing some of our past best experiences, our peak experiences at the beginning of the day to remind ourselves that basically innately we're whole and we are connected to uh, a, a spiritual source which is marvelous, which is wise, which is loving, which is nurturing, which wants us to have the day go well and wants it to succeed in the ways that can make it go well. Thinking about what draws us out and how we can express ourselves during the day so that we make a contribution to the lives of those we meet. And so some people do that with meditation, some people do that with prayer, some people just do that with reflection or with rehearsing how they would like the day to go. So there's lots of different ways that can happen. I think listening to great music is one way of opening us up to the higher realm of who we are. I think looking at great art and thinking about what's the meaning behind that or how did this person translate 
their connection to a source of beauty into something that which it really is quite remarkable. So there's lots of ways of doing this. I think what, what's incumbent on us is to find what works easiest for us. For some it is painting, for some it is listening to music, for some it's sharing stories with friends and family. But I think often it can be very practical and can be just asking questions. You know, when something unusual is experienced, asking as many questions about it as possible and trusting in the fact that there's a reality behind it. We don't know exactly what that is, but we'd like to find out more. And so trusting the fact that something unusual may have seeds of truth that we can learn from helps take us further into the meaning behind it. And I think it opens our mind to be more receptive to um, these kinds of transforming experiences. Until we develop that communicating capacity, it makes it hard to be receptive. I know when, uh, when my sister was in the intensive care unit in about 1,500 miles away, one morning I was just waking up and then there she was. I saw her come down the driveway and come over towards me, but I don't have the antenna to be able to communicate with her like some mediums do. And yet, it's a very real experience. And as we explore it further and think about it further, I think if we ponder the unusual things that happen to us, we'll open ourselves up further. If we want to explore the possibilities available to us, all we do is have to pay attention to the events that are happening every day to ourselves and to those we're close to. I think most of our experiences have connections to this broader realm if we're willing to explore it further and study it and think about it. We sow what we reap. The seeds we plant are the seeds we experience, and the mind plays a huge role in this. It's referred to commonly as the law of attraction. There's other aspects to that. We also, uh, the reverse of that is also true. We don't reap what we don't sow. You know, if we don't sow seeds of cooperation, then we might find ourselves working in a situation where people aren't too cooperative with us. And if we don't sow seeds of forgiveness and compassion, then friends and family might not treat us in a caring, compassionate way. I don't think that we can simply wish for something to happen, and it will happen. Behind this law of attraction is a need to be committed to something that's worthwhile, a worthwhile value, virtue, or some way that we can be productive or add something that is worthwhile. If it's simply to possess or attract something that we want to have because our life will be more comfortable, we may get it, but we might be called to something greater than that, and it's more likely that we'll be adding to the higher opportunities if we pour our energy into those instead of what we can accumulate and get. The law of attraction has been uh, emphasizing what we, can, what we can do to make our life more comfortable instead of what we can do to add to the quality of the lives of those with whom we associate. Behind that is also the patterns of the ways we've already sown uh, fears and worries of various kinds. And so when we've got a deep pattern of behaving or thinking a certain way, that doesn't change overnight necessarily. We have to work on reminding ourselves that we need the strength to persist with what we're trying to build or create every day, many times a day. And if we persist with that, then eventually we will be able to uh, see new opportunities open in the realm that we're now finding is most important for us. So how do we increase the wisdom, the joy, the higher intelligence, the ability to be compassionate and caring on a regular basis? It's a wonderful question. I, I think it starts with asking the question. I think it starts with wanting those to be a greater part of our life. And so if we can start our day by asking, what qualities of life do I most want to express today or experience today or be aware of? And so if we start with identifying what are the ideal qualities that might be present today, what would I like to add to this day? That draws us closer to it. If we think about what happened the day before and how we would like it to have gone better, and forgive ourselves for not being more attentive or more alert or more capable in some regards, and then ask ourselves how we can learn from that and how we dedicate ourselves to doing it better today. I think that draws it closer to us. 
I think if we respect um, the insight or the wise comments that we hear from other people and pay attention to them and ask them to elaborate on what it is they're sharing, I think we're more likely to draw forth the wisdom and the joy and the goodwill with whom those we interact with. And so it's a, it's a, a slow unfolding process, but the more conscious we make it, the more we activate our uh, will to pay attention, our intention to do as well as we can, I think we're more likely to awaken it within ourselves. We need to start with the world that we're experiencing, the close world that we're part of, and those that we associate with during the day, the, the important relationships that are already part of our day, the routine that has already been set in motion. And if we can make that a little bit better, we will be improving the world. If we respond to the duties, the obligations, the commitments we've already made and simply do our best with those and ask ourselves, how can I do it better? We make things better. It starts with also asking ourselves, what is our highest priorities? What is most important? Is it to bring in enough money? Is it to feel comfortable? Is it to have a body that's totally satisfied with all of its urges and desires and <laughs> ways that it can feel better? Or are there other qualities of life that I'm striving towards? What will be fulfilling to me? What will be meaningful to me? How can I make this day a day that I'll be proud of? If we start the day asking questions like that, we're more likely to awaken higher priorities within us. And so we have a choice. There is the old story about the fellow who was uh, journeying um, and came across a large group of people who were busy doing a number of different things and he stopped and asked one, well, what are you doing? And he said, well, I'm, I'm chiseling this stone and I'm earning a living. So get out of my way, you're in my way. And so he walked a little further. Somebody else who was doing very something similar asked him what he was doing. And uh, he said, well, I'm making money to support my family. Now move out of the way here, I'm real busy and went a little further, somebody else doing the same thing, and he asked him what he was doing, and he stopped and he said, I'm building a cathedral. <laughs> Each of these people had a different priority about what they were doing, and, and the third person had a sense of the higher vision, the broader vision, the, the picture of what was taking place. And you know, we can start the day with that. We can take moments during the day where we think about, why am I here? How can I make this better? How can I enrich this particular moment in time that I'm part of? Even though it's routine, even though whatever the task is, I've done many times before, how can I do it with a greater sense of myself and a greater alertness to those with whom I'm interacting? Depending on the interest, there's more and more taking place all the time. I'm quite aware of the fact that there's a huge wave of interest that's happening and uh, who it impacts and how it impacts them will depend on what their interest is. But there's no doubt that there is greater access to uh, unusual experiences, to transforming experiences, to people's greater sense of what life is about and how to make it richer and more uh, available to everybody. That is happening. I don't see that happening overnight. It takes time. Often it takes generations, it takes a long period of time, but if we can celebrate the steps that we experience ourselves, we'll get more of, of a sense of, of the unfolding nature of it. There's no question if we pay attention to the good things that happen today, we'll be aware of what's enlarging and expanding in our own life. And as we recognize that and some of the milestones that are happening, with other people will become more aware of the larger changes. No, I'm not aware of a huge change that's going to happen today or tomorrow or next week, but I am aware of the fact that there's many marvelous people who are dedicated to bringing about messages of how we can improve our life. That's having an impact. It may seem very slow, it may not seem obvious when you look at the, the public scene or the political scene or the governmental scene, but if you pay attention to the positive things that are happening with some, some marvelous contributions being made, and we celebrate that, it's very easy to get caught up in the frustrations and the turmoil and the terrible things that are happening too. If we let that dominate our consciousness, um, it'll be hard to convince us that good things are about to happen, that an awakening is happening. If we balance that with the, with the marvelous things that we are seeing, 
we'll feel ourselves part of that awakening. And, and I think that's very reasonable and practical for many of us to be part of it in whatever small way that might be and to celebrate that, to be grateful for it and to extend our gratitude in as many ways as we can. I don't see uh, any major collapse. If you, pay, if you only pay attention to the problems going on, you will talk yourself into a collapse. It, it will become inevitable because of the tremendous negative energy that you're tapping into and there's a huge amount of it out there. But we have a choice as to how much we pay attention to. And um, I'm quite optimistic that over time, good things are happening. But, you know, we have free will. We have the choice. And uh, there are people who, who are choosing to take care of themselves and their tribe and could care less about other people. And they do cause damage. And I'm quite convinced that many people are not following their inner direction and they're very self-centered and they're causing trouble for other people and that's unfortunate. Eventually they're going to have to learn the message. Eventually the suffering will happen. I see it happening in people. I see people with serious disease and, and then I try and get them to connect the dots. How did you reach this point? And um, once they go back and reflect on it, um, they begin to understand that. The larger picture is a little more difficult to put together, but uh, the sources that I'm, I'm aware of and, and uh, the wonderful work that's being done, I'm quite aware that there is more opportunity now for growing spiritually than there ever has been before. And for those who are interested, it's there. And there's a growing number that are interested. I don't think it'll take place overnight. But if we get enough people who are interested, it will spread easier. And it'll be easier to learn from the experiences we have so that we uh, extend our growth further.